In this demo, we're going to record a baseline measurement of an ASP.NET application using the MVC Music Store application. You can download this sample application from CodePlex. The URL is mvcmusicstore.codeplex.com. Let's get started. We'll begin by opening Visual Studio and creating a new test project. I'm going to call this MVC Music Store Baseline. Once we have our test project created, we can delete the unit test that it provides for us. And the first thing we're going to do is record a new web performance test. So under Add, we're going to specify Web Performance Test. It's going to open up the recorder. And we're going to record our URL for our store. In my case, I have the store running on localhost on port 8085. Since we're only looking to record a baseline of the home page, I'm going to stop my recording at this time. And it's going to run through and detect dynamic parameters and finish creating the test. It's also going to run the test the first time to make sure that it works correctly. Now in the case of this particular application, it does not in fact have a fav icon stored. So if we look at our test results, we're going to see that that fails. So I'm going to go into my web test and simply delete that request. Now if I run this test again, we should see that it passes. And here it goes. And it's successful. Now that I have a web test that works, I'm going to go ahead and rename it. And we'll just call this store homepage. And one of the things that I can specify also as part of this request is what the threshold is for it to be successful. So when I go to the web test, I can set what the think time and response time requirements are here in the properties of the request itself. In this case, think time is zero. That's the amount of time that the load test will delay between subsequent requests for this URL. I'm going to leave that at zero. And in my response time goal, I can also set, for instance, to one second. And this will make it so that my test will fail if this response time is exceeded. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now I want to add a load test. So I go back to my project and I say add load test. And here we're going to see the load testing wizard. We can set various things like the load pattern, the test mix, what kind of network the virtual users should pretend to be on, what kind of browsers they should be using. We can also define the counter sets that we want to track. And then we can set how long the test should run. I'm going to go ahead and set a load count of 10 users. And we're going to say everything else is just as default. We're going to add our test. So when we come in here, we're going to add our store homepage test. You can add multiple tests here, and we'll see that in later modules, how you can actually mix various types of tests, such as web tests and unit tests, within a load test. For now, we're just going to load our homepage. And for counters, we're going to go ahead and add localhost so that we can look at a few other counters, such as SQL and ASP.NET and we'll finish that. And now we can start our test. So at this point we just click Run and this will start off our load test. By default we'll see four panes in our load test. You can change that here so that you can spe specify which panels you're interested in. Let's look at each one. In the Key Indicators pane, we'll provide a little more room here, Under key indicators, we're looking at user load, pages per second, average page time, errors per second, and then any threshold violations. Threshold violations will turn out to be things that are predefined by the system, such as CPU level that's being used. We can see that these threshold violations are currently occurring at a rate of about one per second. And you'll see them here as well under controllers and agents where our CPU processor time is currently 
pegged at 100% while it's doing this test. That's because we have no think time, and we're trying to run these page requests as quickly as possible, and so it's simply utilizing all of the CPU available in order to run the test. We can look at page response time here, and this will show us the average page time that's involved. You can see that this is well below our one second threshold. And then our system under test here is also showing the processor time, memory, and transactions per second for the system under test. In this case, since I'm running everything on localhost, these counters are actually showing me the same things that my other, some of my other counters are showing. Now we're going to let this run for the 10 minutes that we said, but I'm not going to make you sit here and watch it, and then we'll analyze the results. All right, now there's only a little bit less than a minute left. Let's add a couple more counters and rearrange this display to optimize it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look under computers, where you may recall I added the SQL Server counters. And in here I want to look at batch requests per second. So I'm going to add that to my key indicators by just dragging it over to that particular panel. And then the other thing I want to do is I really want to focus on that key indicator panel. So I'm going to switch to one panel view. And I can switch between the different windows here using the drop down. You can see here I'm on key indicators. And if I click on my batch request per second, it'll highlight it here above. And we can see that it's averaging 620 database requests per second. Obviously, we don't want to hit our database on every single page request. In this case, well, multiple times actually, on every single page request. So in this case, we can see our pages per second is around 200, and our database batch request per second is around 600. So we're making three different database calls on every request to that page. And it turns out that that page could actually be cached because there's nothing on it that's particularly user specific. The only thing that is user specific is the number of items in the user's cart. But everything else we could actually achieve from the cache. Now once the load test completes, you'll see that it comes to this summary page. And this will let you view some of the key statistics from your test. If you are testing numerous pages, it'll show you the top five slowest pages, as well as the top five slowest tests. In this case, we only have the one test and the one page. It will also show you the overall results. So you'll see what the total maximum load was, the tests, for, tests per second, pages per second, etc. And it'll show you the overall test results as well, down here below. Now you can also view this in a number of different ways. You can view a graph showing the same results that were available while we were looking at it. And from here you can drill into, say, key indicators, and then you can further go in and examine a particular section of the graph and see what things look like during a particular time period when there was some behavior that you wanted to examine. You can also look at a detail showing the virtual users. Each one of these lines here is showing one of the users that's hitting the page. And so you can see if we had an, a test that was using numbers of different virtual users, you might find that when a particular set of users was hitting the application, you got a particular type of behavior in your key indicator graph. So this is a, an easy way for you to drill in and see exactly what was happening on the system when that particular problem occurred. You can also view a lot of this data in table form, and you can even export it to Excel for further analysis. Now that we have our baseline, we know that with 10 users using no think time, we can achieve a pages per second of 206 with an average page time of about 31 milliseconds. This is something that we can record and we can use this now when we make changes to the application to see whether or not our changes have positively or negatively affected the performance of the application. That's what our baseline is meant to do, is allow us to have a reference point that we can use when we make changes as we optimize the app.